Thank you so much, and thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I don't know researcher for many years. I think I first of all would like to call myself an activist. Uh, and I've been working on the issue of women's rights for, I don't know when it started or how it started, but for the most of my adult life, um, both nationally in my own country, Norway, but also as part of an international women's movement. And thank you for pronouncing my name right. <laughs> okay. uh, having this family name, this Norwegian family name, can sure be a challenge when you travel uh, around the world, but uh, <laughs> thank you, you pronounce it very, very well. Anyway, I'm not here to talk about my Norwegian family name. Uh, I'm here to talk about sexual violence in conflict. We can talk and talk, but nobody listens. So what does it take to get the attention of the international community? This question asked by a Congolese woman in the film, Women's War, serves as a reminder of the challenges attached to the international response to sexual violence as part of conflict. Sexual violence mostly targeting women and girls, and of course I know that men uh, are also the victims of sexual violence, but that's not what I've been working on especially, but I just want to let you know that I'm quite aware that this can also happen to men, but that's not going to be the topic um, for my talk today. Anyway, sexual violence is widespread and systematic, feature of many wars and conflicts. It's a phenomenon that destroys lives and communities and leaves a terrible legacy for survivors and their families. Impunity. But the challenge of addressing this uh, pervasive reality is made all the more difficult when impunity is the rule and not the exception. In many cases, impunity has been translated into the use of rape as a cheap and effective means of terrorizing target populations to help actors achieve political ends. And these atrocities can also have a direct impact on the ability of women to participate in public life, including in resolving conflicts and rebuilding war-torn communities. Particularly in situations where sexual violence becomes normalized in the aftermath of conflict. And we must not forget the stigma and shame often put on this from society at large, making it difficult for survivors of sexual violence to come forward. Because in most cases, that means being further victimized. So, when do you think sexual violence in conflict was acknowledged for the first time as a criminal act? Anyone? It is known that sexual violence has been part of many conflicts throughout history. But it was all, uh, brought to the international arena by um, the example of the UN Declaration on Violence Against Women, adopted in 1993, and the Beijing Declaration Platform for Action, adopted in 1995. These international instruments highlighted the issue of women in conflict as a response to the experience of women in former Yugoslavia and Rwanda, and the stories the women submitted to the international tribunals on Yugoslavia and Rwanda in 1993 and 1994. Even though the mandate of these tribunals was limited in time and place, yet they did recognize sexual violence and conflicts as a criminal act and a severe violation of human rights. Even more importantly, they showed the way to a permanent, severe, to a permanent international criminal court, the ICC, which seeks to bring perpetrators to justice in cases where states do not have the capacity or willingness to respond to sexual violence at a national level. As you might know, the ICC is governed by the, the Statue of Rome, uh, which is signed by 121 countries um, as of today. But having international instruments like this is not enough. You need to act upon them as well, or you need to use them as well. One might say that there is an international consensus to combat sexual violence and fight impunity. Highlighting the different secu um, UN Security Council resolutions on women, war and women, peace and security, such as the UNSCR 1325, which was adopted in 2000, which said quite clearly that sexual violence in conflict is a threat to international peace and security. In 2008, the UNSCR 1820 was adopted, which spelled out that member states are obliged to prosecute perpetrators and to end impunity. And then there was another one in uh, 2009, the UNSCR 1888, which uh, also, um, uh, how do you say, responded to the sexual violence conflict by, by um, um, yeah, 
by <laughs> hiring, how do you say in English, hiring a representative on sexual violence and conflict, was this a UN representative on sexual violence and conflicts, which had a special target to work on impunity and how to combat sexual violence and conflict. And lastly, the UNSCR 1960, which was adopted in 2010, which also calls for an anti sexual violence and armed conflict and provides measures aimed at ending impunity for perpetrators of sexual violence, including through sanctions and reporting messages, as well as listing the so called naming and shaming of perpetrators in the UN Secretary's General Annual Report. So, you know, we have the instruments, but I think the, the main challenge with these international instruments is there's a lack of effective reporting mechanisms through which they can be enforced. So, Although, internationally, the means to prevent and hold sexual violence in conflict exists, there are questions over how to ensure the accountability of governments, states, local actors, and the international community itself to the human rights norms they would ensure this. So where do we stand? I mean, at present, the most uh, effective reporting mechanism on the violation of women's rights within the UN system are the uh, reports submitted to the CEDA committee uh, every four years by states that have ratified the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Some actors in the field argue strongly uh, for a strengthened focus on different resolutions on women, peace and sec uh, security to be a part of this reporting mechanism, but other has, others have also uh, suggested that to take it kind of out of the women agenda and to uh, have some kind of reporting mechanism uh, within the Human Rights Council um, and that the Human Rights Council councils could be a place where states could be held um, accountable. But I think, but we all should have in mind, according to CEDO, few countries in the world have made it a priority to prevent or punish sexual violence. And bringing justice to the brave survivors has proved to be difficult even in countries where gender equality is formally recognized and effective laws are in place, like my own country, Norway, for example. So the truth is, in spite of the increased attention to conflict-related sexual violence, the evidence base for action is still fairly limited. And this is still dependent on political will and leadership at all levels. So what can we do? Of course, the issue of sexual violence in conflict and how to end impunity is complex, with implications uh, for programs and policies related to health, humanitarian relief, global women's issues, the justice sector, the security sector, and multilateral activities. And for me, in 18 minutes, I don't think I can give you the answer to how to end impunity. It's a, it's a short time. Uh, but I would never uh, the less stress that the numerous initiatives, studies, reports, and recommendations pro provided by so many actors in the field would imply that the question of how to end impunity has already been answered. So in my opinion, this is more a question of how to secure the successful enforcement of international law and standards. Complex as it is, I will give you four, four letters, which I think is important to bear in mind for all actors involved to end impunity. CLAF, concept, collaboration, coordination, legal framework, attitudes, and funding. To start with the first C, concept. To be able to prosecute perpetrators and support survivors of sexual violence in a certain country, context, uh, context or at the international level, an assessment of the specific, specific situation is crucial requirement. This assessment, in turn, should be the foundation of a comprehensive approach whose programs incorporate all existing requirements, actors, including national institutions, NGOs, especially those consisting of uh, and or representing survivors of sexual violence and women's groups networks, and also needs in the re uh, relevant national context, because I think what you have to be aware of is that you can't assume that a single concept fits all cases. There will be variations in extent and different forms of sexual violence, the intent behind it and the impact and the identity of the perpetrators. With the example from the Second World War, um, soldiers from the Red Army raped thousands of women as they entered Berlin. In Vietnam, it has been said that American soldiers raping Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese women has by some been called a standing operating procedure. 
in Colombia, it is said that the perpetrators of sexual violence is um, by all participants in the conflict, including the guerrilla groups, paramilitary forces, and the state security for forces. In Burma, for example, the state armed forces continue to be the, uh, the main perpetrators of human rights violations, including systematic rape. And another example is sexual violence against female prote protesters by Egypt Egyptian security services reflects a prevailing attitude among judges and police that rape is not a matter of public justice. And we shouldn't forget that humanitarian and peacekeeping personnel is also perpetrators. And in post-conflict situations, perpetrators also include members of the community, ex-combatants, family members who take advantage of the, the impunity and an embedded culture of violence. With the example of Liberia, the rape continues to be the most frequently reported serious crime. Collaboration is everything. As mentioned, there are several actors involved, nationally as well as internationally. And I think the cooperation uh, of the UN, the governments, researchers, NGOs, peace missions, humanitarian aid organizations, the security sector, and especially women's groups and networks, including survivors of sexual violence, is essential if lasting results are to be made possible. To be effective, I think the struggle against the impunity uh, must address the responsibility of all actors and all relevant actors and involve substantive collaboration between all stakeholders. This would also involve a deeper coordination between countries and stakeholders in a holistic approach. And let's face it, at the end of the day, the essential task of holding governments accountable depends on a strong civil society. But the situation of civil society differs from country to country and between regions. But even so, uh, a joint effort and commitment by government and civil society is especially critical in situations where state capacity is limited. In this regard, I think a strong network of women's organizations nationally and internationally would be a prerequis prerequisite for ending impunity. And this has also been especially um, important in bringing the issue forward to, international, to the international level, as I mentioned earlier. And then you have the legal framework. This uh, picture by, by uh, I should tell you, is taken from a, a report from Colombia about bringing justice for the victims of sexual violence. I mean, as you all know, it is the responsibility of the national uh, s justice system to bring perpetrators of massive human rights abuses in their territories to account. But in the aftermath of conflict, the inclusion of sexual violence as part of tra transitional justice processes and the establishment of rule of law are challenged by different factors. Even so, there are some important things to remember as procedures for prosecuting crimes of sexual violence on both a national and an international level often discriminates against the survivors of sexual violence, exposing them to further humanization and re-victimization, making them visible while the perpetrator remains invisible. So, First of all, laws must be in place. And then a model of best practice would be political will to prosecute crimes of sexual violence, training of all staff, a dedicated team of investigators and prosecutors, care for the well-being, safety and dignity of survivors, including support and protection services and witness preparation. preparation. An enabling courtroom environment where survivors are treated with sensitivity, respect and care. So, given the unwillingness of or incapacity of many national governments to provide justice survivors uh, to survivors of sexual violence, the international community has the responsibility of taking these cases to the International Criminal Court, like I mentioned earlier. But they can also seek justice for survivors by enacting and enforcing legislation that can help bring the perpetrators of sexual violence to account wherever they are based, by enforcing the principle of universal jurisdiction. There should be no safe heaven for perpetrators. But to achieve global accountability, one needs to look at cross-country judicial and civil society cooperation in tandem with capacitating efforts to investigate, investigate crime, ending impunity involves building the capacity to analyze and monitor. <coughs> um. <coughs> So, attitudes, where do we start? 
An important question is how to change the attitudes of the general public as a key to long-term prevention and stopping sexual violence and conflict. I mean, this can be done in many ways, like with a public discussion of, um, uh, about violence, particularly with men and boys, uh, can help foster the recognition that sexual violence is a violation of the rights of women and girls. In this matter, it's important to include the media in the, and also use different communication strategies in the dialogue. But using b media can also be difficult, even though it's important. So by using media, you should also think about how to design programs to increase journalists' ability to sensitively interview survivors and report on the impact sexual violence has on individual communities and nations. And of course, how to involve men. I think how to involve men would be important for every single issue on gender equality. But I would also like to pose the question, who bears the uh, responsibility of involving men? I mean, we cannot win this war without half the world, uh, less than half of the world actually, present. And I must tell you that there are now several examples of programs targeting men, especially redefining the concept of masculinity to remove the emphasis of power and violence to allow a more equal and peaceful gender relationship. I see the time, but yeah, I just want to tell you about this picture because these pictures are trainees um, from the Philippines training young men in gender roles, gender stereotypes, so forth and so on. Uh, it's a very good program in the Philippines, uh, working with young men, especially it's from a young men's camp. But last and not least, and it needs to be said, and it's always boring to talk about money, but funding, funding is important. Because bringing justice to survivors requires adequate support system. And the funding available for in initiatives to combat sexual violence to end impunity, especially those affecting survivors of sexual violence and women's organizations, is still insufficient compared to the scale of the problem. I mean, reliable funding and capacities needed to address the root causes on sexual violence and to, and to prevent it from becoming normalized in the aftermath of conflict. The importance of creating sustainability through a long-term commitment as dealing with the issue offers no quick fix. So showing commitment to funding, I think it's extremely important. So let's sum up. To get to the point where impunity is the exception and not the rule, there are several things that need to be in place. Political will and leadership, accountability by all actors involved, and also effective reporting mechanisms. And CLAF, content, col content collaboration, cooperation, legal framework, attitudes, funding. But most important of all, that needs to be uh, included by all actors involved, is nothing about us without us. Thank you so much. <clears throat> okay.